It seems like every single time I make one of my lore videos, somebody's gotta show up in my comment section to tell me just how much they miss the old 40K. You know, back before 5th edition, when it didn't take itself so seriously. It was just this bombastic universe that never felt the need to explain itself and reveled in its edginess. They swear to me up and down that back in 1st and 2nd edition, the Imperium would just exterminate us worlds left and right. Nowadays, in modern 40K, they need like, a reason to do it. And my answer to a lot of these people is, have you been following Necromunda? Cause I gotta tell you that early 40K is alive and well, deep in the dystopian nightmare of the lower hive. If you're unfamiliar with it, Necromunda is a sister franchise to 40K. The entire thing takes place on a single hive world and its story is told from the perspective of a whole bunch of criminals. The thing I love about Necromunda the most is that it's undoubtedly a Warhammer story, but it removes all of the elements that we've gotten so familiar with and makes it feel like you're rediscovering the grimdark all over again. In this video, we're gonna talk about all six of the major gangs who wage never-ending war in the lower hives. And I'm just gonna be honest with you, the basic elevator pitch for what each one of these gangs is, is kind of incredible. You've got your religious fanatical trash men, toxic roller derby riot girls, forge master gigachad clone babies, techie irradiated grandpas, shadowy matrix enthusiast squid ghosts, and of course, the Iron Brotherhood, AKA the mining chads. By the end of this video, you're gonna know everything you need to know about all six of these factions, including who they are, what they're all about, and what makes each and one of them so ridiculously cool. But before we dive headfirst into the grimdark, a quick shout out to this video's sponsor. Today's video is sponsored by Holzkern, an Austrian-based company that makes some super unique and stylish high-end watches and jewelry, all centered around nature and sustainability. Their catalog features hundreds of different designs that all utilize a combination of unique materials, including wood and stone, which I think is pretty awesome. Now, personally speaking, I'm not much of a jewelry guy, but I am a huge fan of their watches. They were nice enough to let me pick out a couple to try out, and my eye was immediately drawn to the space dust and the thicket. They both have genuine marble dials, but whereas the space dust utilizes a combination of stainless steel and rich walnut wood, the thicket ditches the metal for a full walnut build. Now, both of these watches are fantastic, but I actually ended up wearing the thicket a lot more often. The walnut is just so much lighter than metal, and most of the time, I forget them even wearing this thing. Also, they're both compliment magnets. And just being honest with you, as a dude that doesn't get a lot of compliments in my day-to-day -day life, after I received the first one, I started wearing this thing pretty much every day. Holzkern offers free express shipping worldwide with products arriving in two to five business days. They also offer a 24 month warranty on their watches, bandlets, and jewelry. And since they have so many designs to choose from, you're sure to find something that's absolutely perfect for yourself or as a gift for someone special in your life. And speaking of which, they're having a sale right now for Mother's Day, so you can pick up something special for the woman who brought you into this world. Use my link down in the description below and my discount code WESHAMMER to save 15% off your entire order. Big thanks to Holzkern for sponsoring this video. Before we dive into the six major gang houses, we need to better understand what this world is and what it's all about. So Necromunda is both the name of this franchise and the name of the world that it takes place on. It is a hive world dotted by thousands of massive hive cities that are grouped together in what are known as hive clusters. Each individual hive can be home to billions of people. And unless you're one of the few lucky nobles that lives in the spires of the upper hive, your life here probably isn't so great. The lower hives are a dystopian grimdark nightmare, and the lower you go, the less your life is worth. As the planet is an industrialized center of production for the Imperium, its hives are made up of monolithic factories and refineries. The workers here aren't viewed so much as people and more as numbers, cogs whose primary purpose is to aid the Imperial war machine. If you were to be a worker here, you would most likely spend your entire life toiling away in incredibly dangerous working environments, and you would likely die being crushed under a giant piece of machinery. Most of these factories are an OSHA agent's worst nightmare. Oh yeah, and sometimes members of the upper hive even like to participate in a good old timey sport where they throw on a suit of pseudo power armor and descend into the lower hives to hunt the people that live there. You know, for funsies. If all that wasn't bad enough, law and order is not something the higher ups are exactly keen on enforcing here. Instead, the lower hives are controlled by the clan houses and all of the gangs that work for them. Each of these houses is an enormous criminal industry made up of families that war against each other for territory, resources, and whatever scrap they can pry from the cold, dead hands of their enemies. 
The gangers consider themselves the backbone of Hive Primus, the men and women that do all of the real work, so the lords and ladies up above in their realm of marble floors and clean air don't have to get their manicured fingers dirty. The scummers that toil in the smoke of the manufactories and turn blood and iron into profit. Although the lower hives of Hive Primus are where the majority of Necromunda's story takes place, there is another realm that is far darker and far more dangerous deep beneath the surface. This place is called the Underhive, and it is a lawless subterranean labyrinth filled with the decaying structures of ancient cities that were built thousands if not tens of thousands of years ago, many of their remnants dating all the way back to the Dark Age of Technology. The abandoned facilities here form a sprawling hazardous labyrinth, characterized by its perpetual darkness, dilapidated ruins, and an endless array of claustrophobic tunnels. Although there are gangs of mutants and societal rejects that have managed to eke out an existence here, this is pretty rare. The Underhive is ludicrously toxic, polluted, and oftentimes irradiated. Food, water, and breathable air are scarce commodities, and cave-ins and other geological disasters are commonplace. If this wasn't somehow bad enough, it's also full of straight-up monsters. Giant spiders, crocodiles, rampaging mutants, maybe even a Chaos or Gene Stealer cult or two. If it's a subterranean monster that you think could potentially exist within 40k, then at least some kind of variant can be found within the Underhive. With all that said, you may be wondering why anybody in their right mind would ever come down here, and that's because the Underhive is absolutely chock full of treasure and lost archaeotech. You see, when most of these places were originally abandoned, the people that lived in them didn't really have much time to pack up, so all of their tech is still down there waiting to be found. This means that gangs and other would-be explorers frequently send down expeditions here, and when they run into each other, it's all-out war. The Underhive is massive, spreading over hundreds of miles, and to this day, only a very small portion of it has actually been mapped out. And if I'm being honest, most of those maps are pretty much worthless, as frequent natural disasters and the shifting nature of the Underhive itself means that what is and isn't accessible down there is always changing. This means that every single trip into the Underhive could reveal an entire cache of incredibly valuable equipment, something that the gangers think is worth dying for. Now, I could sit here and gush about just how fucking awesome the entirety of Necromunda is pretty much all day. It's like if you were to take Warhammer 40k, Cyberpunk, and Mad Max, mash them all together, and then turn whatever that is into a heavy metal album cover. But this is supposed to be a video about the major factions that can be found here. So without further ado, let's dive into each and every one of the six major gang houses, and we'll start with everybody's favorite fanatical trash men, House Cador. If you're just getting into Necromunda, and you want a quintessentially 40k gang, then look no further than House Cador, as they perfectly managed to blend the religious zealotry common throughout the grimdark future with the bleak reality of what it's like to exist in the lower hives. The vast majority of this gang lives in abject poverty. They're all scrappers, scavengers, and bone pickers, with the only ones who know anything of actual luxury being the house masters all the way up at the top. All of them survive off of their endless efforts of shifting through the discarded refuse of the hive itself. And let me tell you, these dudes love their trash. It doesn't matter if it's a piece of scrap, if it's fully intact, if it's worthless, or even somewhat valuable. They venerate it nonetheless. They're constantly scrounging through the vast canyons of waste within the hive for lost wealth or relics that they can barter with. Now, aside from the scavenging, they also make money by doing a variety of dirty jobs such as dangerous machine repair, gunk tank emptying, or in some extreme cases, their members have even been known to volunteer themselves to be used as live bait in order to capture the creatures of the bad zones. Cawdor owes much of its existence to an extremist cult known as the Cult of Redemption, which began on Necromunda centuries ago as a splinter sect of the Imperial Creed. Its influence spread quickly through the lower hives and eventually traveled along trade routes between hive clusters. At this point, there are few if any hives left on Necromunda that the cult hasn't established a footprint in. Out of all of the cult's faithful, it was House Cawdor who embraced their teachings the most, the two entities eventually becoming synonymous, and today, every member of the house is a firm adherent of its tenets. The Cult of Redemption itself is considered an extremist sect of the Imperial Creed. They still preach the worship of the God Emperor and that through devotion to He on Earth, one soul can be saved. But they also preach that the downfall of the Imperium is imminent. 
Now, this is probably a larger discussion that deserves its own video, but the basic gist is that although the Imperial Creed as a whole definitely has a lot of militant overtones, the Cult of Redemption takes this to a much more extreme level. And you can kind of understand why, considering that it was born in the anarchy of the Underhives, a place where gratuitous violence is commonplace and death hides around every corner. From the cult's perspective, their existence on Necromunda is quite literally a living hell. For mankind to be saved, it must be completely purged of sin. Any that do not adhere to their teachings or do anything in any kind of way that they even remotely deem as sinful must be violently cleansed. On the other end of the spectrum, the larger Imperial cult holds similar views, but violence is normally only utilized against mutants, psychers, heretics, and aliens. The Cult of Redemption and House Cawdor, on the other hand, see sin in every creature. In order to keep themselves free of sin and adhere to their faith, they must abstain from alcohol and narcotics while also submitting themselves to daily self-flagellation and holy prayer. To break from these tenets would be to abandon their faith, and such individuals are thrown out as outcast. House Cawdor basically looks at every single person within Necromunda that isn't a member of the cult as a worthless infidel, and because of this, it should come as no surprise that they're not exactly on the best terms with any of the other gangs. That is, with the begrudging acceptance of House Orlok, whom their territory shares a border with. But it isn't just the cult that has influenced House Cawdor, as it's also worked in the other direction as well. The house has always labored to salvage resources from the waste of the hive, and thus the Cult of Redemption has embraced this practice, teaching that the process of recycling is a miracle made manifest. Fun fact, House Cador is actually considered to be one of the oldest houses on Necromunda, a trait that they attribute to their devotion to the cult, as through their faith, they remain strong while other houses have risen and fallen. That being said, this isn't exactly possible to confirm as their records are pretty sketchy at best. They may not be rich in wealth or resources, but they make up for this by being rich in spirit, and there is a certain appeal to the cult. It offers simple truths in an uncertain universe. Though the lives of its members may not be glamorous, they do have a unified purpose, which year after year ends up attracting a ton of new recruits. It's a generally held belief that their rapid increase in size is due to their faith being used to convert outcasts and rejects. But there are also a lot of dark whispers of what are known as child harvesters that are said to prowl the dark streets to kidnap lost youths. They then conscript them into their house and brainwash them into the cult's teachings. Whether or not these rumors are true or not though has yet to be confirmed. Within the house itself, men and women are highly segregated at every conceivable level. It's not that they view one gender as superior to the other, more so that they have very conservative views when it comes to the traditional role of the sexes. The only time they ever see each other is under strictly ritualized circumstances. The vast majority of their crusaders and gang fighters are male, whereas the women are taught to be dutiful wives and not to question their lot in life. There are very few chances for a woman in Kaldor to rise out of this position, though in the past there have been many who have disguised themselves as men, defected to another clan, or have broken off to form their own gang of like-minded women. And this last one is actually more common than you might think, as there are many notable female redemptionist gangs that often stylize themselves off of the Sisters of Battle, individuals that the entire cult has great reverence for. Whether male or female, it is forbidden for a member of House Kaldor to ever reveal their face under pain of death. Because of this, they all wear masks or face coverings of some form that they decorate with bizarre and esoteric designs in order to distinguish themselves from one another. When it comes to combat, Cotter gangers are said to be utterly ruthless zealots, fearless in the face of danger and shielded from the sin of doubt by their faith. Fighting off against these guys can be particularly terrifying, as hordes of faceless screaming crusaders hurl themselves into the fray with wanton abandon. They know nothing of mercy or forgiveness and thus expect none in return. The weaponry employed by the gang is traditionally simple in nature and built from both scavenged parts from the refuse heaps and intact components pillaged from the gangs of the other houses. They utilize a wide range of melee weapons and when it comes to firearms, most of them are traditionally short ranged. This is due to their belief that they must stare the heretic in the eye as they purge them of sin. Popular weapons include simple auto guns, stub guns, knives, or other bizarre killing instruments hobbled together from collected scrap. But by far, the weapons they hold in the highest regard are anything that can produce a lethal flame. 
To the zealots of this house, fire is a holy instrument of death that represents the inevitable doom that will eventually devour the galaxy. It is a widely held belief within the gang that the burning death screams of the heretic bring forth benediction from the emperor, the grotesque cacophony bestowing upon all those that hear it an ounce of his blessed redemption. Thus slaying a sinner with a fire-based weapon is viewed by the gang as a holy act. Okay, let's step away from the We Have Black Templars at Home gangs of House Cawdor and go as far in the other direction as humanly possible, the punk rock roller derby riot girls of House Escher. House Escher, also known as the House of Blades, is perhaps the most instantly recognizable and, at least in my opinion, iconic of all of the gangs found on Necromunda. These ladies are responsible for the creation and distribution of almost all the drugs within the hive cities, whether that take the form of combat stems, recreational drugs, exotic chemicals, poison-based weaponry, and everything else in between. Two notable examples being the growth hormones used by House Goliath and the rad purgatives used by the Van Sar. And I just gotta say, I kinda love this, as it adds an interesting twist of dependency to the already complicated and hostile relationship between the gang houses. Because having a stranglehold on the drug market is incredibly lucrative, and a good portion of House Escher's competition is dependent on their products, they've managed to carve out a considerably powerful notch for themselves in the hierarchy of the clan houses. Making or breaking an alliance with them is not a decision to be made lightly, as a constant supply of chems at a good price can keep a house prosperous, but if that supply ever comes to an end, well, it's better just to stay in their good graces. At a glance, House Escher is comprised entirely of women, but it didn't always used to be this way. Due to the millennia of exposure to toxic chemicals, the men of House Escher eventually became withered husks with extensive damage to their genetics. The frail and sickly men born to this house must be kept under constant medical supervision at all times. At this point, their only real useful contribution is through breeding. And quick side note, I know it's not all of you, but I'm going to talk to the sickos and sex pests that watch my videos real quick. I know what you're thinking. That doesn't really sound like that bad of a deal, does it? You get to lie around all day, not doing much of anything, and every once in a while, the only actual job you have to do is a bit of snoo snoo. But the house technology has progressed to the point where procreation the old-fashioned way is rarely ever done. And more commonly, it's done through simple chemical stimulation. So it's not as great as you think it is. This dynamic has become so normalized for the ladies of Escher that they look down on and pity all men for having the misfortune of not being born a woman. But it is worth mentioning that in the novel Terminal Overkill, we get to see a unique example of a brother and sister dynamic within House Escher, as the boy was actually born in good health, which is an insane rarity. Growing up, the two of them are inseparable and care deeply for one another, the sister beating the absolute crap out of anyone who would dare pick on her little brother. This is a one-off example, but it shows that their views are a little bit more complex than the larger narrative may sometimes give them credit for. Anyways, when it comes to how the house is structured, the ruling figurehead is known as the Matriarch Primus. This individual is viewed as their queen and is a role currently filled by Adina Sabine. Beneath her is her council of crones, each and every member being the most prominent figurehead from the most powerful Escher families. Underneath the crones are the matriarchs, the shivers, the gang queens, and the chemist clans. Each gang leader in the house rises through the ranks through actions of destruction, violence, and furious intelligence. Most of them come from a life of crime. They may have been narco-terrorists, riot girls, or even failed combat stem test subjects prior to being recruited. If one particularly promising ganger begins to make a name for herself, other house gangers will start to follow her lead. They will match how she acts, what she wears, and even how she likes to kill. But none within the gang would dare try to overshadow her. The Escher combat style stands apart from the other houses of the Hive. As for them, killing is often seen as an art form, an expression of their lethal skills. This translates to them using a wide variety of unorthodox methods of murder in order to stand out and gain a reputation for artistic death dealing. The culture of partaking in extremely toxic chems and drugs has been completely normalized for them, and most of the stems they use amplify their abilities to ludicrous proportions. They've got drugs for everything. Drugs that make them stronger, faster, smarter, more accurate with a firearm, pretty much anything you can think of, they've got a drug for it that comes in a little glass vial. However, not all of the chemicals they synthesize are designed for them, and are oftentimes weaponized and used against their enemies. Venom-infused weapons and chem-gas grenades are common within the gang's arsenal, and are used with wanton abandon. 
They may have something of a, if you'll excuse the pun, toxic reputation, but don't get it twisted. They are also exceptionally skilled in a firefight with or without their poisons. Pinpoint shots cited to achieve the most visceral explosion of gore frequently earn a young Jew credit and respect with her sisters. If things get dicey, House Escher has been known to go as far as flooding entire areas with chem gas, which will cause the opposition to go insane and start killing each other. Then the ladies of the house will sweep into the area and join in on the festivities with chem stimulants of their own. They're said to be absolutely crazy and ruthless when it comes to taking and defending territory, and any mercy they show their enemies is nothing more than a facade. To those who have been captured by the Escher alive, the lucky ones will just be subjected to ruthless beatings before being ransomed back to their respective house, whereas others will end up the unwilling guinea pigs of all of their new experimental concoctions. If the other house decides that the hostages are not worth paying for, and the Escher ladies decide that they've outlived their usefulness as test subjects, they'll likely be thrown into the firing range so the gang's juves can get a little bit of target practice in. House Cador and House Escher may not have a lot in common, but they both agree that it's important to recycle. Because their house has grown so large and powerful, their gangers commonly develop pretty inflated egos. They feel no need to hide in the shadows like lesser gangs, and their hideouts are traditionally loud and flashy, real classy upscale establishments, at least, you know, by lower hive standards. The deceptive opulence of their strongholds causes their reputation to spread via word of mouth and constantly attracts new recruits looking for a better life. Whereas the gangers of House Escher are all about finesse and style, the hulking giants of House Goliath prefer getting into a brawl the old-fashioned way, by kicking in the door and breaking anyone or anything that gets in their way. The Goliath are the youngest of the six major gang houses, and their history is pretty dark. You see, early in the 40th millennium, the at-the-time ruler of Necromunda, Lord Alberoth Helmar, got it in his head that things in Hive Primus sure would go a lot more smoothly if they had a race of superhuman slaves to do all of their hard work. Especially all of the work that was too dangerous for normal people to do down in the deep irradiated areas of the Underhive. In order to turn this into a reality, he arranged a contract between House Van Saar and House Escher to use all of the technology and chemicals at their disposal to come up with a new subservient race of abhumans. The early results were not exactly successful, and they ended up with a whole bunch of unstable genetic abominations. But eventually their work would begin to bear fruit, and the first of the Goliaths were born. These guys weren't particularly intelligent, but they made up for their lack of brain power with a frankly irresponsible amount of muscle mass. Ironically, these guys seemed pretty docile at first and made for effective workers, but that all changed in the year 519 of the 40th millennium, when the death of Lord Alberoth led to the Goliaths finally revolting. The new planetary governor that would end up taking over, Janus Helmar, saw the idea of a subservient race to be inefficient and antiquated, and thus allowed the revolt to continue without Necromunda's authorities getting involved. Even still, it took several centuries for the Goliath to be completely free and become an independent power in their own right. By the middle centuries of the 40th millennium, they had established themselves as a new clan house and a major player within the hierarchy of the lower hives. What makes the Goliath so unique is that the vast majority of them are actually vat-grown clones that are mostly male and mostly sterile. They come out of the vats fully grown and most only live for about a decade, as the gene science used to create them isn't exactly stable. After about 10 years, all of their organs start to break down, and it's pretty rare for one to survive any longer than that. And to say these guys are enormous is a huge understatement. Many of them are even larger than an unarmored space marine. But again, the science used to create them doesn't come anywhere close to the gene crafting employed by the Emperor in the creation of the Astartes. Since they don't live for very long, part of their creation is to imbue them with all of the knowledge collected by the Goliath that came before via a cranial data slug. This means that the Goliath are kinda like orcs in that they are birthed into the world fully grown with a baseline understanding of their planet, their place within it, and all of the knowledge needed to contribute to their household. Debate on whether or not these guys technically meet the criteria to be considered abhumans or not has gone back and forth for centuries, but as of today, the representatives of the Adeptus Terra that are stationed on Necromunda have deemed them sanctioned to live and work within Hive Primus, so long as the current Lord Helmar continues to monitor their developments. 
When we look over at Goliath culture, they are easily the most straightforward of all of the house gangs. And from their perspective, the entirety of their moral code could be boiled down to the phrase might equals right. The house prides itself on its hulking gangsters that are made using the best gene smithing and the most potent gene altering chems available on Necromunda specifically. Often such chems are bartered for or stolen from House Escher, fueling their age-old rivalry. These big, thick boys and, in fairness, a couple of ladies, use their bulk to work grueling jobs in the foundries that are the house's main source of income. Their short lives are filled with backbreaking labor and gratuitous violence. But as any gang worth its salt will tell you, money isn't all about fighting. You have to have other revenue streams as well. To this end, all of their territories maintain a series of forges and refineries, where all of the gangers will pump out iron. Whether this be used for building materials that they can sell, or an endless supply of new weapons for the gangs. The organization of House Goliath is also pretty straightforward. There's a supreme ruler known as the Overtyrant, who holds dominion over both the clan and the flow of strength-enhancing narcotics. Beneath him are his Alphas, renowned for their brutality, and rare amongst the Goliath, the Alphas are all naturally born, thus having longer lifespans. The other 99% of the house is made up of vat-born gangers. And no matter where they are in the hierarchy, all of these dudes are addicted to strength. And that addiction is not just a turn of phrase, as in they are quite literally addicted to the chems they use to continuously grow their muscles way past their human limitations. And sure, on an individual level, this may seem like a bad thing, but the house masters of Goliath have turned this into an advantage for the entirety of the clan. They've come up with these things called chem collars that are fitted around the neck and inject just a little bit of stems and drugs at a time. This keeps the gangers from ever having to experience the deadly withdrawals that would happen if they were to go cold turkey, and it makes sure they stay addicted and thus loyal to the house. Ironically, if they were to suddenly stop consuming these drugs altogether, their muscles wouldn't necessarily atrophy like you might think. Quite the opposite, in fact. They would start violently growing out of control. Their skin would rip apart and their organs would slowly begin to be crushed under their immense bulk. If not treated quickly, this almost always leads to a particularly brutal death. So because all of these Goliath gangers are addicted to these drugs, and the house masters control the supply of those drugs, their loyalty is basically assured. However, there are rumors of a subsect of Goliath gangers that exist deep within the Underhive that have replaced those drugs with some form of black market chems, and thus they are their own masters. Whereas most Goliath gangers are characterized by their simple minds and huge muscles, the leaders of the house are said to actually be pretty cunning, intelligent, and ironically charismatic. They make for excellent leader figures in combat operations and thus never actually work the forges themselves. The grunt work like that is left to those beneath them. Because their primary role is to seize profit and territory for the gang through brutal violence, they are often better equipped than all of the other Goliath members. They're gifted with the best armor, weapons, tools of destruction, and a pick of anyone they want in their crew. And when it comes to Goliath combat tactics, I'm just gonna go out on a limb here and assume that you know where this is headed. The Goliath have no interest in being subtle. Fancy tactics, cunning blows, stealthy ambushes, etc, etc. Those are all the tools of a coward or a weakling. Instead, they prefer to close the gap between them and their enemy as quickly as possible, striding through a hail of bullets and explosions like it's nothing to them. Through the correct application of strength, stamina, and resilience, they make the impossible possible. If, however, it doesn't exactly work out as they planned, and several of their juves end up exploding into pillars of gore and vaporized viscera, eh, meh, they don't let it bother them. Their lives are short anyways, so from their perspective, their buddies aren't really missing much. When it comes to their weaponry, they prefer using massive oversized blunt weapons for crushing skulls and shattering bones, or custom-made cleavers that could decapitate a horse with a single swing. When they do utilize range weaponry, it's normally heavy with a high rate of fire and a shorter range. What's the point of having such intense muscularity if you're not going to utilize it? Heavy stubbers and rivet cannons are pretty common, but a bolt gun or two has been known to show up in the hands of a Goliath lucky enough to find one. Oftentimes, the armor a Goliath ganger wears turns their whole body into a weapon. Much of this armor is created from the gear used in their foundries within their territory. It's often crude and heavy, features lots of chains, and is designed to still show off their muscles. All of this heavy iron that they're sporting increases their overall mass, meaning that when a Goliath charges into the enemy, he's like a one-man battering ram. Other than territories held by the other clan houses, the ones that they like to go after normally take the form of abandoned sledge heaps, rad-cursed manufactories, or even sump forges. And all of these places are normally pretty radioactive. 
anyone who has not been given the gene gifts of House Goliath would likely succumb to the constant level of rat exposure here. When they do take new territory, anyone that was there before, they oftentimes will enslave and put to work in the forges. These scrawny weaklings might not be worth much in a fight, but they can still be used to produce resources and equipment for the house. Now, I know this might come as a surprise to you, but trade negotiations, which are a pretty common thing amongst the gang houses, even though by all accounts they're pretty commonly at war with one another, are not a tradition the Goliath are really about. They only form alliances or trading packs when absolutely necessary, and traditionally will only barter for technological items or drugs that they don't have the means of producing themselves. Only a fool would willingly enter into any kind of pack with the Goliath, unless they are absolutely confident that they have the means to protect their assets. It's not exactly uncommon for the Goliath to suddenly grow frustrated with any kind of negotiations and just decide that taking what's yours would ultimately be easier and would save everybody some time. And with just how well-equipped and stacked these guys are, in fairness, they're rarely wrong in this assessment. So the last couple of gangs that we talked about tend to lean towards the crazy end of the spectrum. So let's bring it back down and talk about something vaguely resembling normalcy. Let's talk about House Orlock, also known as the House of Iron, easily the most chadly of all gangs. These guys are a massive industrial superpower funded by countless ore miners that labor away to claim the natural resources of the planet. Their control of the ore supply is so strong that even House Goliath oftentimes has to rely on them for ores for their furnaces. Over time, they've expanded their operations beyond the hives themselves, creating a stranglehold on the convoys of materials from the slag heaps that lie in the ash wastes. These guys have been on friendly terms with House Escher in the past and have a long-standing rivalry with House Deloc. This house got started back in the 38th millennium and was actually formed by a bunch of ash waste nomads. You see, one of these dudes was named Olandis Orlock, and he had something of a reputation for being rather prosperous. And that couldn't be more spot on as one day when him and his family were out in the waste, they got caught up in a severe dust storm that was powerful enough to flay flesh from the bone. Well, thankfully, they stumbled upon a mysterious ancient shipwreck and ended up taking shelter inside. And this wasn't just any old junker craft, oh no, it was absolutely chock full of ancient archaeotech worth a sizable fortune. Since nobody else knew the ship's location, him and his family were able to siphon off pieces of it over the coming years, until they had amassed a considerable amount of wealth. It got to the point where Orlok grew powerful enough to threaten all of the other minor clans into allying with him, or risk being destroyed. After he had amassed a considerable amount of allies, he declared war on one of the most powerful households at the time, House Orlund. Orlund and the newly formed House Orlock waged a brutal road war against each other out in the waste for multiple decades. Realizing that this war could drag out indefinitely, Orlock used his ridiculous charisma to bring in even more lesser houses to his side. The newly ratified House of Iron continued to grow stronger and stronger, eventually destroying Orlund and absorbing all of their territory and resources. Now, I would forgive you just from a glance thinking these guys don't look all that impressive. They're not hulking abominations like Goliath, they don't have the poisons of House Escher, and they aren't a frothing horde of zealots like House Cawdor. For the most part, they seem like totally normal, functioning members of society. Honestly, if you allow me to get a little bit meta here, they're the ones that remind me the most of real-world powerful crime families. And the notion of family and loyalty is very important to them. Their house motto is gang before house, house before the rest. It is a motto that is commonly referred to as their code of iron. Their strong family bonds ensure that they can rely on each other and their indomitable fighting spirit to face off against any challenger. House Orlock is ruled by a bunch of notable clan families, the largest and most powerful at the top being Clan Orlock. Beneath them are the other allied families who have married into Orlock, each having their own role to fill and sphere of influence. Clan Kamen, for example, is the masters of mining, whereas Clan Cinderjack rules over the engine cults that create all of their vehicles. Beneath all of these families are individuals that the gang just refers to as drudges, surf workers, peasants, and, of course, all of their indentured servants. Now, in other gangs, these individuals wouldn't be seen as anything better than slaves, but Orlok views them a little differently. Every single person, no matter where they come from, has potential. They just need to prove it. If they do so, they'll be permitted to join one of these families, offering them a way out of the crushing poverty of Necromunda. And this philosophy makes a lot of sense, as it's a prominently held belief within Orlok society that hard work leads to both power and ensured productivity. 
As long as you can work, there is a place for you in House Orlock. Be you man, woman, child, elderly, disabled, it doesn't matter. And whereas that sounds good on paper, what this traditionally ends up looking like in practice is a life of never-ending servitude working deep in their minds. It's stable work that will support you, but if you actually want a better life, the best path forward is to prove your worth and loyalty to the house and take up arms as one of their gangers. The weaponry produced by House Orlock is famed for both its sturdiness and reliability. They do not view their guns as disposable, and each one they produce is expected to be handed down from fighter to fighter for generations. They might not be as fancy as anything from House Van Sar, nor as cheap as anything made by House Cador, but most importantly, their guns are dependable. From their perspective, if a weapon cannot be relied upon to fill their enemies with iron slugs whenever the trigger is pulled, then it has no business being in the hands of one of their gangers. As a result, auto guns, stubbers, and shotguns tend to feature prominently in Orlock gangs. Although House Orlock does seem to be more united than the other houses, infighting does occur. Often, when one of the lesser families gets it in their head that they should be the one at the top of the pecking order, these rebellions don't normally last very long and order is quickly re-established. The house's control over their territories has been carefully orchestrated and loyalty is strictly enforced. If anyone should be brazen enough to speak of rebellion, they will soon be subjected to the business end of a psi whip or electro goad until nothing but blind obedience remains. Now, despite these scuffles, Orlock is united in its purpose of production, thus their industrial output is considerably above average and their gangers are more well-equipped than most. At the end of the day, life on Necromunda is both miserable and incredibly dangerous. House Orlock offers those that swear loyalty to them and are willing to work a path to success, but they rule over their territories and all those that toil within them with an iron fist. Not only this, but they have successfully utilized campaigns of propaganda in the past to turn any ire against the house back out towards the other gangs. In the face of such terrible adversity, it seems unavoidable that the gangers of House Orlock would develop the creed of the Iron Brotherhood, us against them. With it, they always have brothers and sisters to fight at their side until death. Without the creed, they are alone against a hostile universe. However, if someone doesn't live up to this creed, the gang will show them no mercy. It's not infrequent for an Orlock Juve to turn up in a ditch with a knife in their back should they flee a fight, leaving their gangmates behind to die. For Orlock gangers, the gangmates need to be just as reliable as an Orlock stamped slug thrower. Whereas the weapons of House Orlock are famous for their reliability, the ones produced by Van Sar, on the other hand, are famed for their technological superiority, and thus they command a ridiculously high price tag. But that being said, the secretive methods they use to make them end up turning the Vansar gangers into a bunch of irradiated grandpas. This dude here on screen is probably in his mid-twenties, but hey, that's just all part of the hustle. Even the nobility of the upper houses are willing to pay top dollar for anything with Vansar's name on it. And because of this, they've established a long line of alliances with the merchant guild, clan houses, and great houses of Necromunda, bound together by a web of licenses and patents. Vansar is by far the wealthiest house in the entirety of the Lower Hives, and also the most technologically superior. Their laborers are highly skilled in the production of tech, thus the entire house is dependent upon their efforts for its continued existence. And from everybody else's perspective, how they're capable of making these wondrous devices just doesn't really make a lot of sense. Gang warfare in Necromunda is normally characterized by a lack of resources and weaponry that's anything but sophisticated. Hell, the longest running joke in the Necromunda tabletop community is that the humble LAS rifle, which in the 40k tabletop game is considered mass produced garbage and has abysmal stats. In Necromunda? That's military grade weaponry, baby. It's one of the best guns in the game. Gangers have killed for far less. And although there's a lot of truth to this meme, when you look over at Van Sar, their forges are pumping out plasma cannons, multi melthas, shock mauls, even weaponry that's particularly rare for 40k standards like grav or rad guns, which I think we can all admit is a little bit more powerful than a LAS rifle. The secret of how they're capable of producing all of this stuff has been closely guarded for generations and is known to no one outside of the house. Much like just about everything involving the Van Sar, their early history is clouded in secrecy, and there's a lot of conflicting reports on how exactly they got started. The most prominently held belief is that they were not actually natives to Necromunda, and in fact, were scientists and settlers from the time of the Imperium's technological peak 
who were suspended in cryostasis aboard their ship. This ship would end up veering wildly off course and would end up getting lost in the warp. When it finally got spat back out, several millennia had passed and they crash landed in the wastes of Necromunda in the 35th millennium. Most believe that the scientist, or at least a small handful of them, ended up surviving the crash. But a popular twist on this theory is that they were discovered by scavenging ash waste nomads, who subsequently murdered them, took all their equipment, and started calling themselves the Van Sar. Whatever the truth, the earliest members of the house would end up establishing a base of operations around the crash ship, where they would then begin to study the STC within its core. As they had access to an intact STC, they were able to take scavenged junk from the waste and turn it into highly advanced equipment. Over the years, they would flourish as tech scavengers and bizarre brokers, the custodianship of the STC being passed to each new subsequent generation of their order. Under the rule of an architect named Sator Davos, the gang would seek to establish itself a monopoly on all technological resources on this new world, with the ultimate goal of returning the Van Sar to the glory days of the lost age they originated from. Two millennia would pass, and after their previous leader disappeared, the Council of Architects would end up moving the SDC, and thus their base of operations, into Hive Primus, as to better keep it safe. By the time of the 38th millennium, the Vansar had established themselves as a massive center of power, even rivaling the, at the time, current most technologically powerful house, House Hera. And these guys did not like the Vansar trying to muscle in on their techie territory, so they responded with cyber warfare, unleashing cannibalistic codes into Vansar's cortex vaults. And under normal circumstances, their strategy very well may have worked out. There's an alternate reality out there somewhere where the Vansar were destroyed and House Hera still remains in control of all of the technology on Necromunda. But that didn't happen, as there was no way they could have possibly known that what they were attacking in there was a functioning STC. The STC quickly neutralized the codes and determined House Hera to be a threat. Thus, its cognitive engrams instantaneously identified all of their weaknesses and oversaw a series of industrial accidents that left them crippled. The Vansar then retaliated by quickly moving in to destroy Hera in a brutal counterattack. They seized all of their resources and territory and became the undisputed tech masters of Hive Primus. And to say this STC is incredible is a huge understatement. But here's the thing. It's considered to be incomplete and, over the years, has suffered irreparable damage, thus causing it to leak a considerable amount of esoteric radiation. The Vansar are incredibly intelligent, but even with everything they know about technology and a couple of millennia's worth of research into this thing, they still have no idea how to fix it. Maybe it's a critical flaw that really can't be repaired. Or maybe if they had the funding, manpower, and data vaults of a galaxy-spanning faction like the Adeptus Mechanicus, maybe it could. But at the end of the day, they don't. And it's not like they can just contact the Mechanicus for help. If they were to do that, the Tech Priests of Mars would immediately launch a crusade on Necromunda to take it by force. Continued use of this malfunctioning STC has caused Vansar scientists and gangers to rapidly age, doing irreversible permanent damage to their bodies. This is why most of their members look like a bunch of tech-savvy grandmas and grandpas. However, from their perspective, this is a small price to pay for continued access to the STC's seemingly infinite wisdom. The radiation within their main estate is so potent that every person living within Vansar must spend most of their time encased in specially designed suits that regulate their damaged organs and polluted blood. When it comes to recruitment and how the Vansar choose their leaders, they differ from other houses in that they prefer master crafters, tech scriveners, and cognis scholars, rather than the typical run-of-the-mill violent rebellious misfits. From their perspective, it's like, yeah, you kill people real good and that's cool and all, but do you know how to code? Because that's kind of what we're looking for. To the Vansar, their gangers are more than just weapons and tools to be used and discarded. They're inventors, scientists, and artisans. Many would even argue that their knowledge and understanding of ancient imperial technology potentially rivals that of many sects of the Martian priesthood. At the top of the hierarchy, you have these guys known as architects, who are each a master of a specific branch of tech lore. This is the trusted council of master engineers that watch over the STC. Underneath them are what are known as the Primes, who are basically like middle rank overseers. Further down the line, you have the Augmex, which function as the Prime's lieutenants, and everyone beneath them is either a tech or a sub-tech, which are used as catch-all terms for workers and warriors. 
Whereas other gangs will often utilize captured slave labor and hordes of uneducated workers, every single Van Sar is highly educated and is an expert in whatever task they are assigned. They believe that expanding the house's overall knowledge base is a mission of critical importance. Thus, they take great pride and joy in all of the recovery missions down in the underhive or out into the waste in search of undiscovered archaeotech. Gangers who return with such tech are often adorned with gifts from the house, but these aren't normally physical rewards as would be common in other houses. They may have a new weapon pattern be named after them, or they may receive knowledge known only to the upper cabals, which they can then use to bring back even greater prizes from the underhive. However, the ultimate goal for the Vansar lies in finding a missing piece of the STC device, or at least a compatible piece of Archaeotech that could be used to repair it, and possibly reverse the deadly effects it creates. But so far, this has not happened, and the Vansar rely on blood purification implants and a cocktail of chemicals from House Escher to stave off the worst of the radiation's effects. Each and every Vansar gang or hideout is constructed in the form of a machine temple, where they build all of the gang's necessities. But in comparison to the hideouts of other gangs, they are a technological paradise. Each is easily sufficient for providing the gang with their basic needs, recharging their survival suits, repairing their weapons, as well as being used for basic fabrication and storage. Vansar gang leaders will often pursue the purity of technology by dedicating themselves to the mastery of one of the many mysterious disciplines of the machine. The path they choose will influence both their combat tactics and what type of gang they will end up leading. For example, Arch Machikan Luthric specializes in knowledge of the hives themselves, including all of their ancient and forgotten systems and equipment. This allows his gang to turn the battlefield against their enemies. At one point during a firefight outside of Gothrel Founder's vault, Luthric reawakened the spirits of the ancient and gigantic tunneling machines that had slept unmoved since the foundation of Hive Primus. The machines caused a hive quake, which buried his rivals below an avalanche of steel and scrap. The Vansar are a dour and calculated people that don't view battle as an unplanned affair. You won't catch any of them getting into random gang brawls over a perceived insult like in other houses. Every action they take and every move they make has been meticulously planned out, as defeat would lead to the powerful equipment they utilize falling into the enemy's hands. They can never take this risk, as it would jeopardize their overarching purpose of protecting the STC. They make use of bioscanners and pick thieves in combat to highlight the enemy's location, planning out choke points and escape routes long before the first shot is fired, all to better ensure their victory. When a firefight is unavoidable, they utilized advanced weapon systems and firearms such as LAS carbines, rad guns, and all manner of plasma-based weaponry. The Vansar and all of the other clan houses we've spoken about so far do their best to maintain a prominent and visible presence within the lower hives. In order to maintain their power, they must appear powerful. It might sound kind of lame, but branding is super important. Whether it be through the unity of House Orlock, the over-the-top establishments of House Escher, the faith of Kador, the advanced equipment of Vansar, or the armor and clothing of House Goliath that canonically is designed to show off as much of their physique as possible, all of this sends a message that they are not to be crossed. But the final clan that we're going to talk about spits on this philosophy. Fancy weapons, armor, and hideouts are all well and good for the lesser clans, but it is the unseen elements, the intangible assets that a gang controls, that truly make them strong. Turns out, the most valuable resource on Necromunda isn't money or weapons, it's information. Something as simple as an idea or a rumor can cause more damage over time than any firearm. House Delac, also commonly referred to as the House of Shadows, is shrouded in a thick veil of secrecy. While the other houses prefer showing off or proving their dominance, Delac waits in the darkness, watching and listening to pry away valuable information. They are a legion of spies and assassins, saboteurs that are said to be so good at what they do, many of the noble households have long-standing contracts with them. It's even rumored that the Delac are employed by the planetary governor, Lord Helmar himself, thus acting as both his eyes and ears beyond the walls of his palace. These rumors are fueled further as Delac seems to have perks and privileges within the Hive that no other clan house does. The gang has access to things such as lucrative trade contracts, off-world tech, and even Hive districts specifically desirable to them. Perhaps this is an exchange for a constant flow of info being fed back to the Helmars, or perhaps they have earned these privileges another way. 
But whereas other houses often declare all-out war in order to seize or defend territory, the Delac seem to play a different game altogether. To many, it seems like the Delac are attempting to circumvent the struggles of the Lower Hive and rise to the ranks of the great houses in the Upper Spires. But even this may be a lie started by the house itself in order to shroud their true objectives. Outside of the house itself, nobody knows anything about these guys. What they're all about, what their objectives are, what their history is, it's all a complete mystery. The process of trying to even look into something like this is a doomed task, as one will inevitably encounter nothing but a labyrinthian network of lies and misdirections. Some say they are a failed genetic experiment of the noble houses, or a treacherous breed of shape-shifting alien that has managed to infiltrate Necromundan society. There are even rumors that claim they managed to uncover a terrible truth about Lord Helmar and his family, a truth they used to blackmail him into giving them access to pretty much anything they could want. If this rumor is to be believed, then while Lord Helmar seems to give them access to their pick of territory, he also secretly funds a proxy war between them and all of the other houses. Although many believe this to be the truth, and certain elements of it may indeed hold some merit, why would the Delac choose to not usurp the Helmars if they have such a tight stranglehold on the royal family? This most likely is just another misdirection created by the House of Shadows in order to further muddle the truth. Rumors about House Delac dance around both the spires of the noble houses and the gang hideouts of the clan houses. Some believe the power and position they hold in the hives is not through their spy work and espionage, but rather something much more outlandish and alien. The most widely held belief, and the one that is given the most credibility in their source book, is something altogether more creepy and baffling. And I actually covered this in a lot more detail in one of my Grimdark Mystery videos. So make sure to watch that one after this if you want all the juicy, creepy details. I've thrown a link for it down in the description below, and it will be in the end screen at the end of this video. Anyways, the abridged version of this is that millions of years ago, Necromunda was an ocean planet inhabited by sentient aquatic lifeforms that worshipped these leviathan sea-dwelling deities known as the Silent Ones. At one point, a cataclysmic event occurred wherein the ocean suddenly began to drain away, and fearing the extinction of their gods, these ancient alien fish people built deep underground flooded cities for them to dwell in. They then returned to the surface and did what all of the other creatures on Necromunda did they died. Millions of years later, after Necromunda had been firmly established, there was a great sleeping plague that affected the lower hives. Thousands of people would wake from their dreams and be compelled to leave their hab structures and travel deep into the underhive. When they all gathered together, they felt a strange kinship with one another, like they had finally found their family. The theory goes that the spirits of that ancient Xeno society had actually somehow survived for millions of years, and then through dreams possessed the inheritors of their world, taking over their bodies in order to be born again, their ultimate goal to one day reawaken their sleeping gods deep below Necromunda. Now, whether this is true or just another misdirection ultimately doesn't really matter, as the gangers of House Delac take full advantage of the endless rumors that swirl about them each and every lie being wielded as a weapon against their enemies. Every action they take is calculated to further the mystery of the house. They wear lenses that hide their eyes, shave their heads, and traditionally wear darkly colored trench coats that disguise the weapons, armor, and assassin's gear they may or may not be wielding. All of these things add to an unknowable nature about House Delac, which is exactly the reputation they desire. They want to keep their enemies off balance and unsure of what they're capable of, unsure of what lies behind their lens goggles, unsure if they have a grav gun or a web gauntlet hidden below the folds of their long trench coats. Now, whereas the general public of Necromunda doesn't know anything about the Delac, we have been given insight into some of their secrets. Whether they be human, alien, or some kind of genetic abomination, they all have a particularly powerful mental connection to one another. This is accomplished through the use of psychic Xenos devices known as the Psychoterica. This technology allows members of the House of Shadow to communicate telepathically, even at great distances. We also know that even though on the surface there doesn't seem to be any kind of discernible structure to the house, they do have leader figures known as the Silent Ones, the entire group of nobles being referred to as the Star Chamber. The structure of this hierarchy is all contained within the Gestalt consciousness of the Psychoterica, which means A, outsiders are not privy to any of their secrets, and B, if a member of the Delac is found to be wanting by the Silent Ones, internal conflict can be sudden and vicious as the entirety of the hive mind is turned against the offender in an instant. 
The hideouts of a Dalok gang are never obvious, and thus it's common for people that live in the area to not actually have any idea that they're in the middle of their territory. Some even claim their hideouts and strongholds are actually invisible. Oftentimes, the house will set up shop in the walls between hab domes, in forgotten ductways that link different hive levels, or even beneath the graded floors of places like hab markets. They do not make it obvious when a territory is secretly laboring for them. They are said to often be everywhere and nowhere within the hive zones of territories under their control. And this makes it really hard to actually communicate across gangs. You'll only ever find the Dalok if they want to be found, and thus they will commonly utilize systems of obscure symbols and markings that a common local will not understand. Perhaps that's a common street graffiti, or maybe it's a map to the nearest gang hideout. And that was all six of the major clan houses in Necromunda. Which one of them was your favorite and why? Are you a fan of the fanatical trash masters or are the rock and roll roller derby chicks more your speed? If this is your first thing that you've watched on Necromunda and you're just getting into this sub franchise, it's important to know that this isn't all of the playable factions. Necromunda is absolutely massive, and over in the tabletop game, there's a whole lot more, from the corpse grinder cults, the squat prospectors, the ash waste nomads, etc, etc. I absolutely adore this franchise, and think it's ridiculously interesting. It's a setting full of all kinds of crazy, over-the-top characters, factions, and locations. And personally, I'd love to do more Necromunda content in the future, so if you want more videos about this crazy hive world, then definitely let me know about that in the comment section. As if I'm just being honest with you, I'm not really anticipating this video getting a lot of views. So if you want to help me out, make sure to check out Holzkern by using the link in the description of this video, as well as code WESHAMMER to save 15% off your entire order. With the exception of the Imperial Fists that recruit from this world, there's a particular lack of Ceramite-clad super soldiers in Necromunda, which sadly often equates to this amazing franchise getting a lot less attention than it rightfully deserves. So if you want more Necromunda content, definitely let me know about it in the comments section. Anyways, big thanks to everyone that supports the work that I do, and I'll catch y'all in the next one.